I have a little something. I have a uh, something to show here. They had a bit of a dust up in the Sandwich Islands, yeah. as I understand it. A couple diplomats there, and you know the stories of those. But what I want to do is show a an artifact from the Sandwich Islands, uh, and Kara and the other folks at home. You might know the Sandwich Islands better as the birthplace of our current president, Hawaii. Um, and this is a proclamation from the king of Hawaii, uh, King Kamehameha the Fourth. It is a proclamation of neutrality issued on the 26th of August, 1861. So, insofar as Hawaii has anything to do with it, in 1861 they're saying, we don't want any part of the Civil War. We're not North, we're not South. We're Hawaii. Um, to some extent, Lincoln has to worry about Hawaii, doesn't he, Kevin? To some extent, yeah. Um, <laughs> they um, One of the great lessons of international relations and grand strategy is that you have to keep your eye on the ball. You have to, yeah. you, you have to know your strategy and, um, and, and stay on it, um, even as these kind of distracting um, diplomatic events, current events, um, are coming at you mm -hmm. and, and and keeping you from reaching a goal. Um, and it, Hawaii was the Sandwich Islands was was one example um, of that. Um, and it's one of my favorite episodes in the story. Is um, it, it's this is the fall of 1862. I think it's the period between the prelim, preliminary Emancipation Proclamation and the um, and the final Emancipation Proclamation. It's like October 1862. Um, and Lincoln is getting these letters saying you've got to replace your diplomats in the in the Sandwich Islands. Um, one of one of whom is a friend of Lincoln's back from Illinois. Um, and um, Charles Sumner um, is writing Lincoln letters. Sumner is the, the head of the Foreign Relations Committee at the time. He's writing Lincoln letters and saying, this is endangering, Sumner's from Massachusetts, he's saying, this is endangering kind of maritime, you know, our shipping interests in Massachusetts because these guys are so incompetent. And, they're, and, um, and Lincoln's friend, this guy Greg, mm -hmm. blames um, another, another of the diplomats there, this guy Dreyer, and they both kind of, they're calling each other drunks in the letters back and forth. And... Um, um, and it, be, it becomes a very distracting thing for Lincoln when he's, he's actually doing something very important in preparing the ground for emancipation. He has to deal with this. Um, and um, and so, so, so that, was, that was one example. And, and there's a, a, a great letter from Lincoln to Seward um, that says, um, so I, I don't remember the exact words, but something about the Sandwich Islands and says, we need a tip-top man there next time. Um, and, um, you know, another interesting little tidbit about the Sandwich Islands, Mary Lincoln, um, tried to get her candidate appointed as a diplomat in the Sandwich Islands. I mean, that's one mm -hmm. of the things we forget about diplomats in this period is, in many cases, they're dilettantes. I mean, they're, and, and sometimes worse. I mean, the diplomatic corps was a place to send political enemies, inconvenient radicals. A lot of times abolitionists were sent to diplomatic posts um, to get them out of the way. Um, and, um, and, and I love this, they were also considered vacations. So there you have, there's a scene in the, in the book where Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick, comes mm -hmm. to the White House and he's trying to get himself um, appointed to um, a position in Florence. And you, know, you don't get the sense he's trying to bolster his diplomatic skills. He wants yeah. a vacation in Florence. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and he doesn't get it, by the yeah. way. Um, there's another great story about this um, from, um, um, also about the Sandwich Islands. A group of men come to see Lincoln um, mm -hmm. and they try to get their guy appointed in the Sandwich Islands. And they kind of make their case um, on the merits. Um, but then they go into this riff about, they say, you know, our guy is really sick and the weather would be really good for him in the Sandwich Islands. Can you please send him there? And Lincoln has this great line. He says, um, you know, gentlemen, uh, unfortunately, I have eight other applicants for that job and they're all sicker than your man. Um, so he sends them, he sends them on their way. Um, by the way, Lincoln, Lincoln's friends once tried this yeah. with Lincoln himself when he was younger. In 1841, mm -hmm. Lincoln was going through a bout of depression. As a young man, mm -hmm. he went through periodic bouts of depression. And um, his friends wrote to Daniel Webster, the Secretary of State um, at the time, and said, you know, Lincoln's really not doing well. Can we send him to Columbia? I think the change of scenery would be pretty good. And, yeah. and Daniel Webster probably, to his credit, said, no, he doesn't have any experience. I don't think <laughs> so, we want to send him. So, uh, so a vacation in Hawaii is it was even a, uh, a a treasured thing back then if you could get it a free trip 
right. to Hawaii. <laughs> exactly. And Mary Lincoln sometimes, by the way, was successful. Yeah. She didn't succeed in the, yeah. in the case of Hawaii, but she occasionally got her diplomats um, appointed to posts. And mm -hmm. one, one example was a consulship in Scotland. Um, um, she got one of her candidates appointed. And um, um, she, there are some great, um, I think they're in the letters of Cassius Marcellus Clay, who mm -hmm. was Lincoln's minister in Russia, yeah. who's this great character. He's got, walks around St. Petersburg with Bowie knives hanging, hanging from his waistband, and he gets in fist fights on the streets of St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And um, he was a childhood friend of Mary Lincoln's from Lexington. Um, and I don't think, she didn't get him appointed, but, um, but she knew him. And there's this great reminiscence, I think it's in his, his diaries or, or somewhere, where he says, Mary essentially came to me and said, Mary hated Seward. And, and Clay remembers Mary coming to her, uh, coming to him and saying, you know, don't pay attention to anything Seward says. Seward, you know, nobody pays attention to, to what Seward does, so you don't really have to pay him any mind. I mean, can you imagine the first lady interfering in, in diplomatic matters <laughs> in that way? Mm -hmm. um. Boy, we're going to have to plow through a bunch of questions here at the end. And I don't. I, I thank you very much for the folks at home for sending in your questions. Uh, we may uh, get to ask some of them without having them fulsomely answered. Uh, but I do want to to acknowledge you folks at uh, at home. But I don't think we can get out of the foreign policy topic. Look, can't keep looking at the clock here, without wondering what Napoleon had in mind and what that meant in the U.S. I do think Americans, when they look at the Civil War, um, forget to look south of the Rio Grande and try to figure out what, what Emperor Maximilian, who he is, right. and what Napoleon and Europe is trying to do uh, with this blockade, I guess, if you want to call it that. Yeah, it's a forgotten episode, I think, in a lot of the, the writing about the Civil War. It could have brought and, conflict. It could have brought war. Yeah. Um, in 1861, France, mm -hmm. Britain, um, and Spain um, embark on a mission in Mexico to recover some unpaid debts. And Britain and Spain quick, quickly withdraw their, their troops. Mm -hmm. But Napoleon stays. Um, in 1863, he conquers Mexico City. In 1864, he installs his puppet, the Emperor Maximilian, that you mentioned, on the Mexican throne. So in the middle of the Civil War, Lincoln has this mm -hmm. major challenge to the Monroe Doctrine, just mm -hmm. south of the Rio Grande, and has to figure out um, how to deal with it. And um, I think Lincoln handled this um, uh, very well. And his, his Lincoln and Seward's policies were not um, particularly um, different on this. Lincoln made a mistake um, in dealing with um, uh, the, the Mexican issue at first. Lincoln made some mistakes in diplomacy, mm -hmm. by the way. I don't, I don't want to say that Lincoln did every single thing right. And one of the mistakes he did is Lincoln was very, in, very concerned about sending an army to the, to the Rio Grande as a kind of a message to Napoleon. Um, and um, what this did is it diverted troops um, that, that could have been used on, on other engagements. Um, and it led to some, it led to some military debacles um, and, um, and it was a bad decision on Lincoln's part. But what Lincoln did right, and, and, Seward, and he and Seward were in lockstep on this, is that he kept his troops north of the Rio Grande. There were serious people at the time and members of the Penny Press, members of Congress, some of Lincoln's um, own advisors who were urging him to invade Mexico and drive Napoleon's troops out to unite the Union and Confederacy, especially toward the end of the war in, in early 1865, um, and, um, and drive Napoleon out. And, and Lincoln resisted that, that impulse, um, that, that advice, um, because he realized that um, Napoleon had problems um, closer to home in Europe. There was an awful lot going on in Europe at the time, that Napoleon was overextended um, by being in Mexico, and that he would ultimately have to withdraw on his own. And I think the episode, I think, really tells us something important about Lincoln and something that's, that's really important about Lincoln's foreign policy, and that's that Lincoln was a master of patience and timing. He really knew when to make his, his decisions, um, and he compared it, there's a, a famous thing where he compares it to watching a pear ripen on a tree. He says he'll wait, he'll wait, he'll wait, and then he'll pluck the pear, he'll make the decision. He was talking about emancipation, mm -hmm. but it applied to, to foreign affairs. And I think patience is a really important thing in international relations because exploitable changes in the international power grid don't happen every day. It's the kind of thing that happens glacially. And so waiting for the right moment and then, and then doing something um, about it is important. And the, 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 the thing that I really like is there's a, a great Lincoln biographer, Michael Burlingame, mm -hmm. who's compared this decision-making process to that serenity prayer that they teach in Alcoholics Anonymous classes. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Knowing the difference between the things you can change in international affairs and the things you can't is really important, and I think Lincoln was really good at that. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, I'm gonna have I have one more question for you, uh, Jared, and then uh, and then we're gonna get you uh, signing some books. And I want to thank some of our friends. Uh, and uh, we might end up asking, uh, talking about one or two more things after we finish. But so we're going to wrap up. But I might ask you a couple more questions. The one thing that I want to make sure that we talked about uh, uh, is is something from the most recent uh, sesquicentennial of the Gettysburg Address. Uh, now we had a, a little bit of a dust up, and I don't want to detail it because I think everyone's been reading the papers and. Um, and, and we know the, that uh, uh, President Obama sent this Gettysburg Address, recorded this version of the Gettysburg Address. Uh, the version he recorded did not include the uh, phrase under God, as the Bliss copy that I read <coughs> earlier did. Uh, I don't really want to talk about that, but I do want to talk about what is this fascination that we have with trying to identify what the Gettysburg Address really is. Mm -hmm. Why do we worry about what he really said? And why, and if the last copy is the copy that he meant it to be, why does it matter what he said or what was reported? Why is that important to us, do you think? That's a great question. Um, and let, let me offer two, two thoughts. So, so, you know, there are all these different versions of the Gettysburg Address out there. Lincoln writes out five by hand. You know, we, we know when probably four of the five were written, the second version, the Hay, what we call the Hay version, it's a little bit more in contention. There are also various newspaper transcriptions. You, you all were kind enough to show me your original version of the Chicago Tribune a few moments ago, which has this completely mangled version of the speech. So there are all these different versions. In fact, in the 19-teens, um, when they are trying to decide which version to put on the walls of the Lincoln Memorial, they start this process to sort of find an, an authorized version or to authorize a version. Uh, and the reason they do that is because at that point in time, Congress has already published over 100 different versions. Uh, and it's sort of gotten, you know, completely out of hand at that moment in time. Now, what, what's the difference? Um, you know, the truth is that the, the differences between the five versions are, are really small. Uh, and they don't change what Lincoln, the message that Lincoln was trying to get across. The Bliss version, the one that we've come to sort of accept, the fifth and final one that Lincoln writes out by hand, the one that assuredly, if you've had to memorize it, is, it's that one, um, is, is probably the furthest from what Lincoln actually said, uh, but it's what he wants you to think that he said. It's the, it's the most perfected one. He writes it out in March of 64. He's had even more time to think and reflect about the message he wants to get across. In a sense, I don't think the different versions of the speech actually actually matter. Um, you know, again, because the message is the same, and that's what's really important. Uh, in another sense, um, you know, it's sort of unfortunate over over time that uh, you know people have pointed to some of the different versions. In this most recent example of. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is President Obama was asked by Ken Burns to read a particular version, which he did, the first mm -hmm. version, which didn't have that line in it. Um, and then it sort of come in for um, some criticism as a result afterwards. But um, I, it's, unfortunately, that's sort of a, a lack of understanding of all the different versions that are out there. Gentlemen, I'm going to get you to signing these books for us, do a little bit of work for us, for the folks at home. Um, and... In the meantime, I'm going to thank some of the folks at home, come back around, and then come back around to another uh, question that I want uh, to ask. Again, folks, we are we do this because you buy the books. You might have noticed there weren't any commercials during the last hour, uh, so we always want to thank you at home for buying these books. That's why the publishers can send great authors like uh, Kevin and Jared here to talk about these topics and to sign your books. And you get signed first edition books. Uh, so thank you, Adrian, in New York. Uh, thank you, Bob in Berwyn, Pennsylvania. Kevin in Wilton, Kentucky. Doug in Louisville, Kentucky. Steve's in Hebron, Nebraska watching us. John is in Kalam Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, thank you, Robert, in South Perth, Western Australia. Um, uh, I know both of these books are going to Western Australia. Uh, Archie in Cloquette, Minnesota. Eric in New York City. Uh, Charles in Roxbury, Wyoming. Harold in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. The Smith family in Longwood, Florida. Thank you, as always. Gary is in Sewickley, Pennsylvania. Tony in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Dan in Joplin, Missouri. Don in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. William in Pawpaw, Michigan. 
thank you, thank you, and thank you, Kara in Woodlands, Texas, for sending in uh, your wonderful question. Uh, and then while you're signing these, I have a question from Wayne in Watto Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, so it's, it's a foreign policy question. From, yeah. uh, and it, it's for Kevin. While politicians, when in power, uh, play an important role in foreign policy, foreign relations continue even with changes of government through the activities of the bureaucracy and the bureaucrats responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of foreign relations. So would you like to comment on the departmental support in Washington and abroad that was available and used by Lincoln and Seward? Realizing we already talked about Ad Adam Gorowski. But that's a yeah, that's a great a great and very smart question. Wayne from Ottawa, Ottawa. sounds like maybe a political scientist or a um, or, or a historian. I'm not sure, but um, um, it, that's it's a really good question because um, although um, I I structure um, the book around some of the personalities and we talk about some of the personalities because the personalities are fun to read about um, and, and and engage us. Um, cut these kind of long term factors are also play a huge role in the, in, in the, the world of foreign policy. Um, power is, is also about, you know, tons of steel produced and, you know, miles of railroad um, track and this sort of thing, these kind of impersonal factors. And, and, and Wayne has picked up on that, um, that that's a really important thing um, to look at. Um, one of the interesting things, and we, we talked a little bit about how um, the, the diplomatic corps was unprofessional at this time. Um, the Civil War did a lot of things to, to unite the country and um, some of the, 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 the um, economic innovations that, that, that um, Congress had passed and um, were helpful. Um, this kind of issuing greenbacks for the first time, the Legal Tender Act that kind of knit the country together in a monetary union in a way, the first national income tax that, that allowed um, resources to be um, extracted um, from the country in a systematic way. Those were important. But the real innovations in what Wayne is talking about in the diplomatic corps didn't mm -hmm. come until later, until the Gilded Age, when you saw a kind of mm -hmm. professionalization of the bureaucracy, civil service um, examinations where you can get professional diplomats who could be held to a certain standard. Um, uh, that, that really didn't come till later. And to me, that only adds to, um, I mean, uh, when you think about what Lincoln did with the raw material that he had, that in itself is impressive to me. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I'm just going to remind everybody at home, these two books, Kevin Pereno, Lincoln in the World, The Making of a Statesman and the Dawn of American Power. It's from Random House, 4 to 32 pages and $26. Jared Peatman, The Long Shadow of the Gettysburg Address, from Southern Illinois University Press in Carbondale, $34.50. I want to thank both of those publishers, Random House and SIU Press. I want to thank the authors for coming here. I want to thank you, the folks at home. Uh, thanks to Dan Weinberg, our camera operator today, and the uh, staff of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, and, uh, and thank you for watching Virtual Book Signing.